It is with great pleasure that I introduce tonight's commencement speaker. He is currently one of the most respected and in-demand voices in America in the realm of modern fatherhood. He's been interviewed by the Today Show, Katie Keurig, NPR, USA Today, The New York Times, and CNN, just to name a few. He is the founder of Daddy Doing Work, an accomplished author and a charter member of NBC Today Show's parenting team. Please welcome home ARHS graduate from the class of 1992, Dwayne Richards. I'm not talking about the graduates. I'm talking about the parents. The parents who raised you, nurtured you, changed your diaper, you did all those things you did. Really to be honest, because without them, without them, you wouldn't be here right now. I mean, literally, you probably wouldn't be here right now. You probably drove me here. But seriously, <laughs> they deserve it. They deserve props. And to that end, I want to recognize one parent who could not be with us tonight. My dear friend in the class of 1993, Wade McDowell, he, he passed away due to cancer a few years ago, and his one and only child is graduating tonight, Kaylee. And I know, I know my dear friend is proud of Kaylee and all the graduates tonight, so I just want to say that I miss you, my man. Whew. All right. Now let's get down to business. You know what's cool about tonight? What's really cool about tonight? That you're not kids anymore. You're not kids, you're adults. You're men and women. Don't let anyone call you boys and girls anymore. You are adults. And with that comes the ability to make some really tough decisions. Decisions you're gonna make on your own. And I truly believe, I truly believe the quality of your life is based on the quality of your decisions. Make good decisions, life's gonna be pretty good. Make crappy decisions, your life might suck. And that's just real talk. So, I'll tell you, everything I learned about decision making, I learned from a two-year-old girl. Two-year-old girl, one of my daughters, Emmy Kill, my oldest daughter, Emmy Kill. She's four now, but she was two at the time. I'll never forget this. We're about to go to the playground, you know, dad's taking the kid to the playground, she's two years old. I'm putting my shoes on, and I look over at her, and she's licking the condo front door. And I'm sitting here like, Dropping water, acting cool, like, what? I didn't know what to do, so I'm sitting here like, there's nothing in the dad handbook for kids leaving the door, so I'm sitting here like, um, um, honey, honey, do you, do you think that's a good decision? She looked at me with her big brown eyes, smiled, started looking at the door. I'm sitting here like, okay. I was like, I got to her eye line. I was like, honey, you know what? Daddy can cook you a hot plate. Are you hungry? Like, I can do that. But you need to talk to me. Listen, is this a good decision? I'm like, this is this a good decision? And she looked at me again. She's like, sorry. And then we went to the playground. And that was it. That's the end of the story. What's cool about that is that I didn't yell at her. I didn't tell her no. I simply asked a two-year-old kid who has no idea what the word decision means. If that was a good decision, she made a decision on her own. Here's the thing. You guys are adults now. I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm not going to tell you what decisions to make. I'm just going to tell you what worked for me in hopes that it works for you. That's it. We're going to do three simple things. This is not rocket science. It's not splitting the atom. All of our classes are way more complicated by the, than the stuff I'm going to talk to you about today. First, love yourself. Second, love others. Three, never quit. It's that simple. So we're going to start with, that's it. So first, First, we're going to talk about loving yourself. There's a little gremlin, gremlin out there called Inge, spelled I-N-G-E, Inge. Let me tell you about Inge. Inge sucks. He's, Inge is just not cool. So this is what Inge does. You're going to your college orientation ceremony, and Inge is in your ear saying, you know what, you can't get with those other students. You're not smart enough. What are you thinking? Or you could be applying for a job or an internship, and Inge is saying, you know what, don't even bother applying. You have no shot, you have no shot. Or, even 
worse, you're at a party and ages in your ear saying, you know what? Get wasted because your personality is lame. No one likes you when you're sober. Here's another shot. That's what so that's exactly what Inge does. So let me tell you what Inge is. Inge is that voice in your head, that imaginary voice in your head that says, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. That's what it is. And I'm here to tell you, every single one of you sitting here right now, with Maroon Beyond on, you are awesome. You are awesome. I'm not just saying that for the self-help guru. Oh, you're awesome. Everyone, you're awesome. You're awesome. You're awesome. You're awesome. But seriously, all of you are awesome. Every single one of you are awesome. The problem is that Inge doesn't want you to know that you're awesome. I'm going to give you an example. Mary Custer. Miss Custer. Can you stand, please? Miss Custer, I love your dress. <laughs> if you couldn't hear what Mary Custer said, she said, thank you. Right? Crazy. Imagine that. Here's the thing. Why is it when people tell us that we're fat, we're lazy, we're stupid, we're this, we're that, we own it. But when people compliment us, we're like, oh no, no, no. I mean, Mary didn't do that, but some of us would be like, oh no, no I'm not. Stop it. Whatever. That's not true. That has to stop right now, guys. If someone says you are awesome, own it. And the thing is about Ange, let me tell you about Ange. The only way to deal with Ange, you can't rehabilitate Ange. You can't reason with Ange. You need to knock that fool out. That's the only thing you can do. You need a bar, not that kind of bar. A bar that you hold in your hand. The bash him over the head, that bar is be awesome and real. Be awesome and real. I'm big on acronyms, people. Be awesome and real. So by being awesome, you realize that you're being awesome. You guys are amazing. So guess what? If you're, someone tells you you're funny, it's because you're funny. If someone tells you you're good looking, it's because you're good looking. If someone tells you that you're nice, it's because you're nice. If someone tells you you're inspirational, it's because you're inspirational. If you're a dude who's into dudes, own it. If you're a woman who's into women, own it. You are awesome. You can play any of The second part of that, be awesome and real, is to be real. And all of you are on social media, Facebook, and all that good stuff. So if you're looking around, you're looking at your friends with your perfect lives, their perfect lives, their perfect friends, and you're like, oh man, these guys are awesome. I can't compete with these guys. My life isn't as cool. So you know what Inch says? Inch says, make stuff up. They will never know. Make stuff up. Just talk about stuff that ain't real. Just make it up. So you do. And you make stuff up, and then Inch is sitting there, like, yeah. Knife and fork, eating up your soul because you're feeling so empty. You're, it's like, oh, here, I'll give you an example. One of my followers on social media sent me an email that said, You know what my three year old daughter did today? She woke up and she made me some French toast. She went in the kitchen, she cooked some French toast, and she brought it to me in bed. She's the best three year old ever. <laughs> well, your kid didn't do that, all right? You know what three-year-olds are doing? You know what three-year-olds are doing? They're licking doors. That's what they're doing. Right? Stop that. You're not fooling anybody. You're not fooling anybody. Look, my thing is, by being real, you have to be vulnerable. By being vulnerable, it's hard to be vulnerable. Being vulnerable is hard. Sometimes when you're, when you're vulnerable, you think that people are going to hate you. That like, ninja's going to tell you, oh, people are going to ridicule you. But here's the thing. The people who matter, the people who love you, the people who care, the ride or die people, will always love you, no matter what. So if you're sad, cry, you're happy, laugh, if you're overwhelmed, ask for help, if you're insecure, say you need help, whatever it is, but just be real. The people who love you will be there for you. So when you feel like you're at a point in your life where you're going to be hard on yourself, just remember the question. Do you think that's a good decision? And hopefully the answer will be no. Now remember this quote. There are no more important words you will ever say than the words you say to yourself about yourself. I'll say that again. There are no more important words you will ever say than the words you say to yourself about yourself. And that's a good talk. <laughs> Next one, number two on my list is loving others. Oh man, social media. All you guys are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And it's just haters, dog. Haters everywhere. Haters. And the thing is, the analogy that I like to use about social media, and I wish I came up with this because it's brilliant. It's like playing chess with a pigeon, all right? Playing chess with a pigeon. So you're, you're thoughtful, you have your glasses on looking smart, they are prescription, by the way. But you have your glasses on, you know what? Pigeon swoops in and says, you know what, I want to play a game of chess with you. Right, cool. So, you know, pigeon, you have to first move. So this is what the pigeon does. 
knocking over pieces, knocking a pool, taking the dump on the board, and then flying away to all the friends and saying, I won the match. He's like, what? I won the match. I won the match. I won the match. And all these pigeon friends are like, oh, yeah, I did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? What's happening? I want to have some thoughtful dialogue. That's what social media is. We don't, it's all about us versus them. It's cops versus blacks. It's gays versus straight. It's men versus women. Mom versus dad. Republicans versus Democrats. It's just us versus them. You pick a side and you take a pigeon bar on the other side. That's just not okay. You guys have to celebrate your similarities. And I'm going to ask you something. Tonight at the senior party, which I'm going to be at. So, <laughs> at, this, at the senior party, I want you guys to do something. I want you to find a person, a classmate, who you've not spoken to, that you've not spoken to, and get to know that person. You know what's going to happen? You're going to realize that you have the same hope, dreams, and fears that they have. Forget all the surface level differences. Inside your heart, you're going to have the same similarities. So please, please, please make sure that you do that. And we thank you that you did. You're going to make a new friend. And also, that's one thing. What if people hate you? What if people hate you? You're not going to hate others because you're going to see very tolerant crowd. But what if people hate you? That's a problem. And I mean, listen, I'm one of the top voices in modern fatherhood in America. I mean, that's, that's what it is. But I'm also a black man talking about fatherhood. You don't think I have haters? I mean, people hate me. <laughs> I mean, I have moms hate me, dads hate me, bloggers hate me, white folks hate me, black folks hate me. Honestly, I mean, the hate, the love to hate scale is like ratio about 50 to 1, so I'm good. But, I mean, I do have my share of haters. But the thing is, I learned is there's one rule about haters, one rule, and I hope you follow this. I call it DNE. DNE, do not engage. You look at some of the most successful people, Oprah, LeBron James, Tom Brady, all these people, President Obama, all these people. They never, do you ever see them online going to you're an idiot with the wrong version of your or posting Kermit the Frog memes at their haters? Do you think they do that? They don't do that. They don't do that because successful people are too busy being successful. That's what they do. Haters major in minor stuff. That's what they do. They major in minor stuff. So do you want to deal with that? You have a choice right now. When people hate on you, here's a bit of advice for someone who's down with it. The best way to deal with haters, keep doing the stuff they hate. Keep doing the stuff they hate. That's really the stuff they hate. So whenever you guys feel the need to be a pigeon or fire back at people hating on you, just don't do it. I'm telling you, make that decision to not do that. And finally, number three, don't quit. I'm going to tell you a pretty personal story on this one. When I was sitting where you guys are sitting right now, I always wanted to be an author. Always wanted to write a book. But the thing is, I had no idea what I was going to write about. So fast forward many years in the future, I had a kid, Emiko, a little girl who likes to lick doors, right? So I had her, man. And I love this kid. I love this little girl with every passion in my being. So here's my passion for writing. And here's my passion for being a dad. Boom. I'm going to create a blog called Daddy Don't Work. It was kind of, you know, pretty successful. But I was like, you know what? After a year, I was like, I'm going to write a book. And then, guess who showed up on my door? I opened up my door, who shows up? Inge and his hater friends. And he's like, you can't write a book. You understand how hard it is to write a book and get a book deal? I mean, you're just a no-name blogger. There's people who have been writing for years who cannot get book deals. You're not good enough. And then my haters were like, you know what? You're a black. First off, no one wants to hear about dads, right? And secondly, no one wants to hear about a black dad. You think, what can anyone learn about a black dad when it comes to father? A black man can't father kids. They have no idea what they're doing. They're idiots. So I'm hearing that. I'm like, whatever. Got this. Got this. So here's the process. The, the quick process. When you want to get a book deal, you have to send a letter, a query letter, to a literary agent who then sends it to a publisher who then you know, offers you a book deal. So my thing was, I had no connections, I had nothing. So I went to Google, that's what I did. I looked for a literary agent. Basically, I wrote a letter saying who I am, what my book idea was, and why I should work. I sent it to 20 people. Nothing, crickets, zero. Like, oh, okay, first month, nothing. Okay, confidence is slightly shaky, but I'm like, okay, cool. We're gonna keep going. Sent out 20 more after I tweeted my letter. Send the second one. 
Nothing. Except for number 39. Number 39, like I said, we only take serious inquiries here. <laughs> Alrighty then. That was, that was not easy, so I said, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not writing this book. Whatever. It's not for me. Then my mentor said, hey, what happens if you quit? What happens if you quit? And I thought about that, and I said, I'd be stuck in a dead-end job, doing a dead-end project, or a dead-end company. But most importantly, that 18-year-old young man that was sitting where you were sitting, I'm letting him down. He always wanted to write a book. I'm not going to let him down. So I kept going. So we're two months in. I sent out 10 more letters for a total of 50. Nothing. Crickets. <sighs> Three months in. This is hard. So I'm about to quit again. So I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to print up a letter. Just a little. Not a letter, basically my headshot. I live in LA, we all have headshots out there. So I printed out my headshot, put it on a piece of paper, wrote it out, and said, This is going to be on the cover of my book. It's a picture of my head. This is going to be on the cover of my book. A book I haven't even written yet, mind you. It's going to be there. So I kept going. 60, 70, 80, 90, 95 letters. Six months in, 95 letters. Number 95 wrote me a bulleted list, 20 items long, why my book idea would not work. That was a kick in the gut. 96, 97, 98, number 98 said yes. And that was my current agent, Fran Black. And she said, I like your idea, go for it. So I was like, all right, this is good. Six months, six months. It's been through from now until the end of the year, people telling you no. That's not easy, but I did it. But here's the, here's the kicker. So after she said yes, Fran, my agent said, you know what, we gotta pitch your book to publishers now. And it could be six months to 18 months. I'm like, no, 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 I, no, I can't deal with it. all those notes. I can't do it. Within the first week, I got my yes. I got, I got my book deal. After that one week, after one week after signing, I got my book deal. And guess what? My picture is on that book, just like that book. Not because it made me rich, famous, it didn't either, but what it did was I held a promise to that young man who's sitting where you're sitting right now who said, you need to go for that, and I did. And I'm telling you guys, right now, my life is great because I'm an author, I have, I, my next book is coming out with Jimmy Fallon's publisher, like, I mean, a lot of stuff happening, I'm a full-fledged author now, like, when, and I kept going. My thing is, listen, love your obstacles. People hate obstacles. I don't understand that. Love your obstacles. You know what the obstacles are? They keep the jokers out. Think of the obstacles like the bouncer at the club. Bouncer at the club. I mean, you don't want everyone getting into the club, the people who can't act right or dress right or whatever it is. You don't want them in the club. Same thing for success. You don't want the people, you want it to be hard. You want it to be hard because you know what? It's not for the person who sends out 10 friend query letters and people say no, or someone who steals your job or steals your business idea. It's not for that and they quit. It's for the people who keep going no matter what. So here's my thing. When you are about to quit, you feel like you're about to quit, ask yourself this question. Is it a good decision? And then ask yourself the secondary question, what happens if you quit? If you don't like the answer, you have to keep going. And last but not least, in closing, friends, I will tell you this. The most valuable resource you have in front of you is time. It's not money, it's not health, it's not love. You can get those back. When time is gone, it's gone. The reason why I'm so passionate about this message is because I wasted so much time. I wasted so much time because I didn't love myself, I made bad decisions, I didn't love others, and I quit. I could have been successful at 20, I could have been successful at 25, I could have been successful at 30, 35. I'm successful now, but I could have been successful earlier because I made so many bad decisions. I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want you to have that. You guys have so much in front of you. So, so many doors. The first door to go through is the door of graduation. So I hope you choose to go through that door with love, loving yourself, loving others, and not quitting. And I hope you don't choose to lick that door. Thank you so much.